where we can turn to Romans chapter 2 and we'll look at these verses that we skipped over last week. We have a bit of a late start, but just going to go away and I'll start late. <laughs> That's all right. Romans chapter number 2, verses 13 through 15, what we're going to look at today. Here in the middle of finishing up his point on being judged, he inserts these three verses. It says, verse, verse, excuse me, verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts, and meanwhile, excusing or excu excusing one another. We'd like to look play at matters of the, the heart today. Amen. What will make the difference when we stand before God ultimately? Verse 13, he says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God. Just hearing the law will not make one right with God. Just as, just simply, quote, going to church did not make one right with God today. Yeah. And yet, there's countless people who think just because they go to church on Sunday that they're going to be okay. Right. Yeah. Just like the Jews, they knew very well the law. They without heard it in the synagogues and the temple worship. Yet just hearing the law or just hearing the gospel even today is not in and of itself enough to save someone or make one right with God. Right. It goes on to say in the next part of the verse, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now this almost seems contradictory to what he would say in the next chapter. Romans 3 verse 20 says, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Right. Well, the doers of the law shall be justified, he says. That really the only way to be justified in the sight of God by doing the law is to keep it perfectly. Amen. And it requires perfect obedience both inwardly and outwardly. The law also it condemns even the slightest infraction of the law. So just the breaking of the tiniest commandment in the eyes of man that's makes us guilty before God. <laughs> the only way we could truly be justified before God in of ourselves would be to keep it perfectly. Amen. You know, the Pharisees, they were good at the outward keeping of the law, weren't they? They appear very righteous. They, before men, they seem to be the best of the best. Didn't they? Mm -hmm. But yet, Christ said, inwardly, they were like the tombs. They were white, beautiful on the outside, yet inwardly they were full of dead men's bones. Right. But to be right with God by keeping the law would be both inwardly and outwardly perfect. I think sometimes we do put a lot of emphasis on outward perfection, but yet we must remember that God sees the heart as well. Amen. Turn over to James chapter 2. <clears throat> one verse here in the direct chapter 1 of James. I imagine we've all heard. These verses before with James chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Amen. Verse 11 says, He that had said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Mm -hmm. And James basically tells us that we're guilty of breaking the whole law. We've just broken the least of one of the commandments. Right. Nope. The most godly of men and yet the most wicked of men in and of themselves are guilty of breaking the whole law. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we are, man somehow thinks that he will be able to keep the law or do good enough good works and be 
right before God. And yet, we are all transgressors of the law. Really, it's only through the obedience of Christ to the law that we can be justified before God. Right. Go back to chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 here, James. Well, after he tells us to lay aside this wickedness in verse 21, he goes on to say, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Amen. Then, so back to what Paul was saying about well, we can't just be a hearer of the word, we have to be a doer as well. We can't just come to church, for example, and think we're going to be right with God. Mm -hmm. We can't just you know, read a verse of the Bible one day. You know, maybe we get up in the morning or scroll through Facebook sometimes and read a verse and know, I did my service for God today. You know, that's just simply hearing the word of God is not enough. And we deceive ourselves and we think that we can just never be doers of the word, as he says here. We deceive ourselves and we think we can just hear the word of God and never take heed to it. The right. He goes on to say, verse 23, but if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or as in a, a mirror, we would call it. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgives what manner of man he is. Mm -hmm. if, if I go in the mirror and see some blemish on my face and do nothing about it, it, do me, it doesn't do me any good, does it? Right. right. That's exactly what he's saying here about being hearers of the word, not doers. Mm -hmm. The Word of God, the law especially, shows us exactly what we are and what we need to do and what we don't need to do. And yet, if we just read it and go about our own way and do what we want to, it really is of no use to us. If anything, it might condemn us more. Mm -hmm. He goes on verse 25 and say, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen. It's, it's never for salvation that we should be doers of the word, but yet in our service for God, we ought to be doers of the word. He said we will be blessed if we do heed to what the word of God says. If we read it and take heed to it, it's, it's warnings, it's precepts, it's exhortations, But to just simply hear it or read it and never do anything about it is really of no spiritual use to us. Here, <coughs> really hearing the Word of God, effectively hearing the Word of God, is Romans would later tell us what leads to salvation. But it also ought to lead us to serve Him. Amen. We cannot expect to be justified in any sense before God or even before man if we are not a doer of the word or a doer of the law, as Paul says. Again, outside of Christ, we will never be able to be justified by these deeds. Amen. Yet before man, we will appear justified. Before man, we can put on that outward appearance, if you will, of being right with God. But we must not forget that it's both an inward and outward doing of the word that is pleasing to God. Amen. But ultimately, it's only in Christ that we can find that perfect justification before God. We'll get to more of that in chapter 3, I believe. Let's go back to our text here, verse number 14. He says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law be by nature the things contained in the law. And the Gentiles, they by nature did not have the law. The law was given to the Jews, and right. a select few non Jews were allowed to be partakers of the Old Testament covenant. But 
by far Gentiles were a heathen people. Right. And it says that if they didn't have the law by nature, they do the things contained in the law. Mm -hmm. That is, even lost and ungodly in the world, they still sometimes do that which is in agreement with the law of God. I think one example that is pretty universal is murder, that people will agree that it is not good to take one's life. Right. Of course, some make excuses or caveats or stipulations on that, but by and large, man would agree that murder is bad. Mm -hmm. But what basis do we have to say that? Well, if we believe the evolutionists, and we're just as animals, and they kill one another, right? there's no consequence for them. If man has this natural, understandable law of God, if I can say it that way, he has this mm -hmm. natural understanding of good versus evil, which is what Paul is telling us here in verses 14 and 15, that man will be without excuse because he does have this this law written on the heart as it says in verse 15 this natural understanding of right versus wrong mm -hmm. this was the objection of Gentiles that they didn't have the law they didn't know good versus bad but yet even their hearts show them that that is not accurate they will be able stand condemned before God because of this. Amen. It says that they have not the law, yet they do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are law unto themselves. Because of this, the Gentiles will have no objection to their own condemnation. Right. Stand before God because by nature, they do those things which are contained in the law of God. Now, do they know to go and wash seven times in the Jordan because of this particular sin? No, but they, when it comes down to the moral law of God, what we call right versus wrong, man has an understanding that's going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Right. And he says they become a law to themselves. They are not, natural man is not completely without any sort of moral law. And he lives his life as if he is lawless, but yet, as verse 15 will show us, we have this law written on our hearts. That we have our conscience and our thoughts as well that convict us of right versus wrong. That Yes, the, the law of Moses was detailed, very detailed in its description of sin and the sacrifices for sin and what to do if you committed this sin or if you did this. And yet deep down man has an understanding of this good versus evil. Amen. Well, he says they become a law to themselves, that they are their own heart and conscience will condemn them. I thought it interesting what Plato, a Greek philosopher, who was certainly not a Christian by our standards, a, a religious a theist, if maybe at best, and he writes this about the law. He says, that Plato divides the law into to written and unwritten. The written law is that which was used in commonwealths, you know, the law of the land, you could say. And then that which is according to custom or nature was called unwritten. You know, such a things as to not go to the market naked or not to be clothed with women's clothes. Mm -hmm. It says which things were not forbidden by any law, but these things were not done because they were forbidden by the unwritten law. Right. Even someone so engrossed in Greek philosophy and and trying to grasp wisdom and knowledge and physical understanding of the world, and yet even a man like Plato knew that there was a law written on the hearts that told man right things he should not do. Let's go on to verse 15 here. He says, 
which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So this, you know, the man has this understanding of the moral law of God. You know, it's been corrupted through the fall. Yet, God wrote this law on the hearts of men. Really going all the way back to Adam, as I said, Adam knew perfectly the, the law of God, didn't he? Especially after the fall, he knew he had sinned. He knew he had done that which was wrong. Right. In case we forget, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they took of. And their conscience were enlightened, if you will, to know good versus evil before that. He was in that state of innocence and perfection. Yet after the fall, he still had this knowledge of good versus evil, and that has been passed down from parents to children and on and so on until we get to today. There is still this knowledge of good versus evil. We've been right, even in the corrupt natural state of man today. You know, I think of, uh, of young children, all of us have probably dealt with them at some point. They usually know when they're doing something they shouldn't know. Right. Well, there's a reason they, they hide or say, oh, no, I didn't do that, because they know it was wrong. So deep down, man has this understanding of good versus evil. It may be buried underneath layers of wickedness and sinfulness, but yet you get down to the core, man, he understands basic right versus wrong. Right. And then he goes on to say their conscience also bearing witness. We have this thing called a conscience that tells men, convicts men of when they do wrong. We can turn over to John chapter 8, we see a very good example of this. John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. We'll pick up at verse 7. We're kind of badgering Jesus about what was written in the law of Moses that they that really this woman was guilty and mm -hmm. she was worthy of death by the law's man. In verse number seven it says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself, or lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone on her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Notice verse number nine. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, the woman standing in the midst. Amen. And their conscience told them they were not right. No, was, did they repent of their sins and cling to Christ? No, conscience will not lead you to that. But conscience will convict you of what you're doing is wrong. I think the problem we see today is oftentimes people have their conscience seared with a hot iron, as right. verse 74 2 distills them. They bad. So nothing then bothers them when they have that state. The yeah, man does have this conscience which tells him that you probably shouldn't do that. Or I probably shouldn't have done that thing that I did. Or maybe I was wrong when I said this. Or even better, we either are saved, we have the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. That leads us to repentance. Yeah, that. The man will be without excuse when he stands before God, knowing right versus wrong. Amen. Yeah, his conscience also bear witness against him. In verse 15, back in Romans 2, it says in their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. You know, the carnal mind says so he'll make excuses for sin, he'll accuse others of sin. The carnal mind is the thoughts, as it's called here, will kind of war against that conscience and the law written on the hearts and say, well, yeah, I was okay if I, by doing this. You know, he's wrong for doing that. We, 
Man is very quick to judge, right? At the same time, excusing our own wrong steps. Once again, man in his natural state has a, a basic understanding of right versus wrong, good versus evil. That which is contrary to the moral law of God. But within his heart and his conscience and in his thoughts, he says, all of those things will bear witness against them though when they stand before God. Without Christ the Savior, even if we had never heard the gospel, even if it was the remote villages in Africa or South America or any of those that are unreachable by the gospel, by man's standards at least, they will still stand guilty and condemned before God because Amen. of Because God wrote the law on our hearts, because He gave us our, this conscience and even our thoughts will convict us. And when I think of this, the thoughts, I mean, while accusing or excusing one another, I might have, we see it today because of social media, those who are often judged by what's called the court of public opinion. Mm. You know, man very quickly makes up his mind whether someone is guilty or innocent, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this accusing or excusing in the thoughts is, means. That in our minds we determine right versus wrong. You know, man is given the ability to reason and think and the logic. Of course, the corrupt nature that is within man is always going to twist those things and sure. will never lead one to God, but yet he does have his basic understanding. I, when I think of this, I also think sometimes those cartoons you used to watch where you have the, the devil and angel on one shoulder telling you <laughs> to do it or not to do it. It's really not quite like that, but. That is how the natural man is. He, his corrupt nature is always going to lead him towards sin, but yet he does have this, this conscience and this law written in the hearts that tells him, no, maybe you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, though, none of those things are going to lead one to Christ, though. We must take a conviction of the Spirit. Amen. But yet, because of these things, man will stand without an excuse before God. One day. He inserts that right in the middle of talking about those who will perish without the law and those who will be judged by the law. And one day Christ is going to come and judge even the secrets of men. The man will not be able to stand before God and plead ignorance or so I never heard the law, or I never heard the gospel, or I, I didn't know that was right or wrong. Because hmm. even though we have this corrupt nature, man deep now knows, like I said, this basic understanding of good versus evil. That will convict him before God. That will condemn him when he stands in the judgment. Amen. The man will be without excuse when he stands before him. No. Lord willing, next time we'll, Paul's going to move on a little bit from these type of thoughts and start talking about, he gets on the Jews a little bit in verse 17 and goes on to talk about those who teach one thing and do another. He really works his way up to that it's ultimately faith in Christ which saves him. Amen. Chapter 3.